as it happened, we had arrived in Bangkok right at the middle of that, I think it was October 1973 revolution, where the military government was overthrown. So I'm not going to go into all the details, but we arrived pretty much right in the middle of a complete chaos. <laughs> I can remember seeing the um, National Lottery office being burnt down because the students believed that the money was being misappropriated and things like that. But that's another thing. After this trouble was over, the, the government, the military dictators uh, fled the country and um, things went back to things went back to abnormal <laughs> so then he took me around to various temples um, I stayed a night in Wat Arun and some other temples and I remember one experience I had there where he took me to a uh, a temple whose abbot was his friend and we we went in and the, there were young monks sitting around a round table their, their, their dana had just been delivered and they must have been freshly shaved their heads were shaved, their eyebrows were shaved and they had these bright orange robes and I thought they just looked absolutely beautiful it was the image of the perfect monk serene, smiling, friendly faces, and etc. And of course in Thailand when you approach monks you sort of have to crawl on the floor. Anyway, we went in sort of crawling on our elbows and that, and my friend said, shut the door. And so I crawled back and closed the door, and when I closed the door, pinned to the back of the door was a Playboy pin-up centerfold from a <laughs> Playboy magazine. Well, that was a bit of an eye-opener, I have to tell you. <laughs> so I was seeing, I was, in a sense, I was being introduced to uh, sort of two worlds. There was the Buddhism of the image and the Buddhism of the reality, at least the reality somewhere. Anyway, I, I won't go into the details, but over the next month, maybe it was, a, maybe it was more than a month, I went, I went to Chiang Mai, we went to Sukhothai, and uh, I was really taken by tra Thai culture. The beautiful, the very uh, aesthetic way they present the food and the beauty of the temples and and some of them really are beautiful. And some, I remember going to the National Museum and just being really quite overawed by the, the aesthetic quality of the art and the culture, and particularly the, particularly the Buddhist stuff. And then I decided uh, I'd better have a look at Laos. So I had quite a lot of adventures there because I crossed the border without a visa. We went across the Mekong River and um, eventually I got a visa but uh, then I went through Laos, uh, we went to Champaka um, and uh, Lung Prabang and once again it, it, this Buddhist culture quite fascinated me but I become increasingly starting to feel that while all this fascinated me and was new and, and interesting, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a monk there. So when my time was up there, I decided to go to Burma. So I went to Burma and um, it was so different in those days. There were very few cars, there was no sort of modern advertising and all that sort of thing. It was a very sleepy, quiet, uh, fading city and um, virtually immediately I met people who were Buddhists and when I told them that I had wanted to become, a, I was a Buddhist and that I wanted to become a monk, almost immediately people were so helpful 
and without going through all the details, I was eventually taken to one of the main temples there where they had the Fifth Council. And there I was introduced to a monk called Upanyadipa. And uh, he taught me some meditation. Um, and uh, this is what I wanted. I, I knew that meditation was an integral part of Buddhism, but I had no idea how to do it. I had tried to do it myself, but without somebody guiding you, it's somewhat difficult. So um, then I went around and had a look at various things in Burma, which once again just fascinated me. I can remember very vividly, almost as if it was yesterday, my experience at the great Shwedagong Pagoda. And I'm 71 now. <clears throat> I have seen some of the great monuments in the world, the Palace of Versailles, the Forbidden City in China. I've seen all of these things, but nothing compares to that stupa. It is the most beautiful thing ever built by mankind, I think. And it's a fitting tribute to the Enlightened One. It is so beautiful. So the, one of these people I'd met took me there, and I remember going there in the evening when it was cool and listening to the chanting and the smell of the flowers that people were offering and the, how, how elegant and, and uh, uh, people were dressed and the, the general peacefulness and that. It, it absolutely absorbed me. And most of all is listening to the tinkle of the bells on the top of the, of the pagoda. It was just enchanting. However, in those days, foreigners were only allowed to stay for, for seven days. So I had to leave, but I wanted more. So I went back to Bangkok, I got another visa for Burma, and I had arranged with Venerable uh, Upanyadipa to do a meditation course. So I arrived back and went straight to the uh, Kabaye Pagoda, that's the name of the place, and I did a seven-day meditation course under the guidance of uh, this teacher with about 25 other people. So that was my introduction to meditation. And for the next several years, I learned that, I did that technique. Then after seven days, I went straight to the airport and back to Bangkok, and I got another visa. And this time, I went to um, Mandalay, and um, Bagan and several other places. And then when I had got that visa for the third time, the Burmese embassy said, we're not going to give you another one, three's enough. <laughs> so I didn't want to stay in, I couldn't stay in Laos because it was clear that the communists were going to tape over fairly soon. And I didn't really want to become a monk in Thailand. So I thought, well, the next thing is to go to India and try there. So after my seven days in Burma, I flew to um, uh, India.